There's like three or four companies that do this. You create a trust. That trust assumes the mortgage. So that trust, you put that mortgage, that liability in that trust. So you do not, you do not pay off the mortgage. You transfer it to a trust, and then you go out there and you buy strips, strips, right? Risk-free, zero coupon, you know, bonds, right? That go and you buy them in the fashion of the exact payments that you needed to, to make on the balance of the mortgage. So that on, you know, whatever, the 30th of each day for the next seven years, strips mature and you pay the mortgage. And so you're paying the mortgage. You're paying the mortgage, you're paying the mortgage, you're paying the mortgage. So, so especially in a securitized environment, you know, you've got a securitization, there's a bunch of mortgages, the servicer don't, doesn't have to worry about how to divide the money. He's going to get the same cash flow that was promised at the time that securitization was done. Make sense? So that's what strips are used for. And there's a fee, obviously, this company gets a fee, you got to pay them in order to do this. Okay? You know, during the lockout period, if you want to sell, you have to assume, do you have to have somebody else assume the mortgage? Is that the only way, or is that not? You can't even do that. Yeah. Now, um, um, the feature, the feature that, the feature that, um, that, uh, that a lot of the fixed rate debt has, so, you know, so, so I mean, there's a market at play here, right? So how do you make these things marketable? So, you know, if you're the life company, you say, okay, well, <coughs> hey, I want all this protection. But in order to get these kind of deals done, a lot of life debt and some of the securitized debt is assumable, but subject to review. Um, so life company debt is difficult to assume, but you can talk to somebody. There's two players in a securitization, and we're jumping ahead. In, in a securitization, uh, commercial mortgages, there's a master, and a, a master servicer and a special servicer. The master servicer is kind of like the mortgage originator and servicer in residential mortgages. He's a guy who collects your check, he holds your deposits, he pays, he pays the trustee, and then the trustee pays the bondholders. Okay? So he's like the day-to-day -day guy. The special guy, okay? So the special guy usually is a guy that buys the equity piece in a securitization. I'll talk about the equity piece in a second. But he's a guy that typically has some skin in the game. And he gets involved when what? There's a problem, there's a default, somebody wants to assume a loan, okay? And so he's the guy that ultimately will determine if a loan can be assumed or not. And that's a problem. It can happen, uh, but I've gotten stuck here. I've gotten stuck here more than once. So you can do it, but you either get through or not. And, 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 and because the guy's got skin in the game, he may not have an interest in, in working with you. He might just say, you know what, the fees alone, I don't care. And I've gotten stuck with that. So just food for thought. Um, there's three or four people that do this here in town. Um, LNR, Rialto, which is a subsidiary of, of Lennar, Torchlight. I think Bayview does this as well. So there's three or four guys that do this in town where they, they buy the equity piece of, of secure, securitization, we'll talk about that. But then they become the special servicer. Okay, so when there's a problem, or when there's an assumption, they get involved. Okay? Any questions on call protection? That's very important. It's very important in commercial real estate. In, in the division situation, I mean, you really can't end up paying two mortgages though, anyway? Well, well, I mean, I guess well you, you, you don't, you don't, what you do is, is so, so the way it mechanically works is, 
you go to your closing, right? You go to your closing, and so you know, buy, uh, seller, buyer. Okay, you deliver to the buyer a property free of the mortgage. Let, let's just let, let this is for argument's sake that say that uh, to make it easy, you sell a building for forty million dollars, and it had a forty million dollar mortgage. Okay, let's just make it easy. Okay, and there's no fees. You get forty million dollars here. Okay, and this guy pays forty million dollars. <coughs> okay, now he gets a building free of a mortgage, but the mortgage hasn't been paid. There's a trust created. I'm making this easy, right? There's a trust created. It assumes that forty million dollar mortgage, right? And you take these forty million bucks and you buy forty million dollars worth of strips. Obviously, there's future value and interest rates, and there's fees you got to pay. You buy forty million dollars, and so what happens is, is that trust over time, as these strips mature, just pays a master servicer. He pays a trustee. The trustee pays the bondholders. But this guy's got a free, free and clear building. Mortgage hasn't been paid, but it's been satisfied. It's been defeased. So you've created the security and the cash stream in order to um, 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 pay, pay it off. Okay. We talked earlier about, um, when we talked about mortgages, that there were at least four, the lender, there, there were benefits to originating and selling mortgages because it created a whole stream of, of revenue and it created liquidity and additional capacity, right? But lenders aren't the only ones that benefit from from that process, right? Because if all of a sudden you can start selling mortgages, uh, you're you're not bringing additional investors into the mortgage space that may have a different risk return profile than what a bank might have, which is then going to create more choices for the borrowers and more liquidity for the buyers and more demand. I'm sorry, more supply to the buyers and hopefully provide a better pricing environment, right? But it's also going to bring a bunch of other, you know, players into the game, right? New servicers, new consultants, investment banks. So, and we'll get into some of it. But there's benefits to all of a sudden creating this pipeline, right? And somewhere along the way, someone <coughs> came up in the 70s with the idea of, of, of creating what are called pass-through certificates where somebody could sell the benefits of a mortgage, the cash benefits of a mortgage, to a different investor in order to provide liquidity. How does this work? How does this work? I'm going to use Citibank. Citibank has liabilities, which are what? Deposits, right? What do they do? They make mortgages, right? They make mortgages. That belongs their assets. They make mortgages, right? So what happens is, is they can only make as many mortgages as they've got deposits, but they got a lot more customers. What? Everybody knows City. Everybody, everybody wants to go to City to get mortgages because they've got good rates. So they got to create additional capacity. So City says, hey. Morgan Stanley says, hey, City, have I got a deal for you. I want to help you create a securitized note. Ooh, what's that? That sounds fancy. So here's what you're going to do. So City's going to go and say, okay, we're going to create for you an SPV. What's an SPV? Special. Okay. Or an SPE. It used to be known as SPE. Or SPE. No, a VIE is a, set, a variable interest entity is something else. An SPV may be a VIE, uh, SPE, no, I, I spe special purpose entity. Okay, SPE, yeah. okay, okay, okay. 
software, an SPE, okay? So they create an entity, they create an entity, right? And what that entity does is, <coughs> it's gonna enter into agreement in which it's gonna buy all of these mortgages. Right? So now, mortgages are here. So now the, this SPV owns these mortgages. And what are they gonna do? Where are they gonna get the money? We're gonna say, okay, here's what we're gonna do. Here's what we're gonna do. We're not a bank, so we can't take the positives. What we're gonna do is we're gonna create a series of securities. We're gonna call them tranches, okay? And those securities are gonna have the benefits, the cash that this mortgages are generating is gonna pass through to the owners of all these securities. Okay? We can call this tranche A, tranche B, tranche C, tranche C, whatever, B, and we can call this E for equity. Okay? So it's gonna say is this, as payments come in, as people are paying their mortgages or prepaying their mortgages, we're gonna to distribute to these shareholders of this securities, okay, the cash flow. Now, there's a lot of different ways, and I'm not gonna spend time in this class on that. There's a lot of different priorities or ways in which this cash can be distributed, okay? But basically, there's gonna be a different risk profile associated with each one of those securities. Um, some people may have all the preference to the cash, some of it may, you may be able to take mortgages that are fixed rate and create a fixed or a floating and an inverse float or tranche. So you could all of a sudden create a floating rate and one minus the floating rate, okay? You can create some that are interest only, okay? You can create a piece that you call equity and you say, you know what, you're the last guy there. You get no cash flow till everybody else gets paid off, okay? So you're just going to create a series of, of securities that are going to have rights to the cash flow that passes through. So a pass-through certificate, okay? And so this is the process. So what happens is, is these shareholders, these security holders, put money here, right? With this money, they pay this guy off. And what can he do now? Originate more mortgages and do this process all over again. Yeah? Now, it gets a little bit more convoluted because you can now have people that say, hey, there are other people that create other SPVs, right, which buy tranches from a bunch of different SPVs, and now instead of having mortgages as the assets, they have passed through certificates as assets. And what do they do? They create more securities, okay? With different features, okay? And, and this one squared and cubed. And so what happened in 2008 when I was telling you the $600 million thing from Bear Stearns, they're out here, people did not know the security that they were holding here, what mortgage was behind that. So it's so slight. Nice. Right, because it was just, you had all these CDO squares, you know, collateralized debt obligations, okay? So, so, so these are, you know, so, so, you know, these were, you know, you can call them Remix, okay? All right, or conduits, you know, but but at least here you've got a direct, you know, see through to the mortgage pool. Once you start coming here, you're like, okay, and then you know you do this again, and now you just got, you just have all these vehicles that own a bunch of securities that are that the underlying is a whole bunch of other securities that the underlying is some mortgages somewhere. But there's mortgages everywhere now, okay? Now, in order to entice these people, there's a process of enhancement. 
So enhancement comes in a lot of different ways. So uh, Citibank would, for instance, pay a monoline insurance company to insure the issuance. So that's one way of, of, of enhancing. But they may pay Moody's or S&P or Fitch to come in and rate it. And rating, while, while it's not a guarantee, is an enhancement because it's telling you what the credit quality is. And the last thing is they can put equity in the deal. And why is putting equity in the deal important? Well, because if they're putting equity in the deal, and they're, and they're subordinating themselves to the last tranche, basically there's more collateral for these guys, and this guy is the guy that's taking the ultimate risk, right? So, so the fact that they would put equity in the deal is also going to essentially entice or enhance um, um, the value of these securities. Now, this happens with mortgages, you do it with car loans, you do it with credit card receivables, you do it with student loans. Anything that generates cash flow. Anything that generates, anything, theory, anything, anything that generates cash flow um, can be a pass through. Okay? Now, in, in Europe, they haven't really done this. In Europe, with commercial mortgages, with commercial mortgages, you have what are called covered loans. And covered loans basically is a similar process, but the lender can replace, the lender will do the covered loan here directly, okay? He won't create this necessarily, or if he does, it, it's a subsidiary. So if a mortgage gets paid off, he's got the capacity to put another mortgage in there. He doesn't have to send the cash flow out. So he, he replaces the collateral. We don't really see that in this country, okay? Now, um, how does this happen in the residential? Trillions of dollars, trillions of dollars. What's the volume of commercial? The last time I looked, it's less than a trillion. I don't know where it is now. It had gone up to about eight or nine hundred billion dollars um, of commercial mortgages. Um, it went down a little bit. It's kind of been building back up, but it's still seven, eight, nine hundred billion dollars of commercial mortgages that have been securitized. Trillions of residential. Now, um, Freddie, Freddie, and Fannie do all kinds of different things. So, and I, I'm not an expert in all this stuff, but so. So what Freddie would do would be something, they, they could buy mortgages, okay? They could buy mortgages and then they create the securities themselves, okay? But they, could, they also buy tranches. And I think that's what they do. Ginny May does this but only with loans that are guaranteed by the VA. So then when you take a look at it, there's a bunch of mortgages here, there's a bunch of pass-through certificates, but not only is this sort of a government-sponsored entity, these mortgages are secured by the VA. So you could say, hey, these strips or these um, tranches, they're, they're probably, um, at least there's probably no credit risk there. Okay, there may be prepayment risk, there may be reinvestment risk, uh, there may be some liquidity risk, uh, but there's probably not a lot of credit risk. Any questions on that? I mean, so this is a this is a bird's eye view, but like if, if you get, and I know you won't do this in the finance class, but when, if you look at the Brueggemann book, you can you can get into like mathematical calculations with the distributions of all this. I don't think there's a value in doing any of that in this program. I think there's value in understanding conceptually how, how securitization works. Um, 
I, I do want to say, so, so there's some macro benefits to securitization, as I said. I started mentioning some, you know, obviously to the banks. Uh, but in addition to that, um, you know, investors. So you're bringing in new investors that wouldn't otherwise have exposure to banks, right? Hedge funds can go into this. Wealthy individuals can go. You and I can buy, you know, securities, right? Securitized debt, right? So you're bringing new investors to consumers, more funds, lower costs, presumably, right? A more consistent and available supply to investment banks, you know, lines of credit, or sorry, new lines of business, more fees, right? Because in the other words, they're the ones that are promoting this, right? To insurance companies, more premiums, to the rating agencies, more fees. So everybody sort of won or wins in a securitization process, right? But, but obviously. Uh, you know, there's a lot of risk associated with that, okay? So, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, we saw where, 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 where did we see issues? Lack of transparency, um, poor oversight, poor judgment with the rating process, insufficient capital with the insurers, um, um, we, we saw we saw with the actual structuring a tremendous amount of, uh, so it was a sort of classic, if we, if we, if we take, if we take a pool of mortgages, we can make a, we can make a package of all really like prime mortgages and they'll get a great rating. But you know what, if I, if I separate those, I can create different SPVs and I can put some prime mortgages with some subprime mortgages or some junk, right? And then, oh, but because there's so many, the risk is going to be spread, right? And I can still rate them high even though I'm putting junk in there. Well, that's not the case. Junk is still junk. So all this stuff eventually all sort of blew up as well, right? So, structural risk too, based on. Well, you can structure, well, that the theory originally was, the, the theory originally was that you would structure the risk based upon the asset pool, but it didn't necessarily work out that way because it sort of affected the whole cash flow of the um, of, of all of the tranches, okay? Um, there was a lot of leverage used here. So, you know, a lot of these situations, of the banks were creating this, but they really weren't putting any equity in it. In the case of Citibank, um, one of Citibank's big blow-ups was that they, they had, so that they created an SPV, to sell all these securities to some of their, their high net worth clients. And they guaranteed collection to those clients. But this SPV was not consolidated on their books and they didn't disclose this guarantee. So when this blew up, they had to come out with like four, five hundred million dollars that they hadn't accounted for. And obviously, again, trickery, right? Because at the end of the day, they were contingently liable for that. They should have consolidated this entity and disclosed the obligation that they had with Dustin. It just seems crazy to me that they're they're trying to create this money out of one income stream and you just keep going down and down and then your fees are being taken out all one way. Like like what point I mean it just doesn't make sense that there's well, there, more but there's, money but than there's there was a, at the beginning. But there's right, so again that's where if if you start working the map, then you can see I mean it could work, right? Because what happens is Right, um, you may have a weighted average yield of six percent on this pool that you sell down here, right? Right, but you ultimately are only going to give up five because you somehow have to account for credit risk and you somehow have to account for your equity somewhere, okay? So the risk spread along the way, people are earning money in this, and what happens is, is I can't make a mortgage for 6%, because I can't assume, what we're talking about all those, you know, the, the, you know, the concentration of risk, the liquidity, right? Presumably these securities have some level of liquidity, okay, they're over the counter, there's no sort of exchange, there's some sort of liquidity for this, but 
investors can't get at the mortgage. They don't have the, the vehicle to originate mo loans, so they can't get 6%. But they'll say, hey, I'll settle for five. Why not? I'll give away a point because I, I can't otherwise get exposure to that kind of debt. Well, down here. Yeah. Well, I mean, I get the benefit that the public can now invest in these mortgages. Well, public, but, but a, a broader base of investors. Let's let's still say that this is really institutional in nature. Well, I guess my what what it starts to fall apart to me is on like the second or third level. It's just I don't know. Well, and so I mean, so it it, it took it took time. I mean, so the the real the real blow up with all this is you know when if you roll back the clock is it ultimately was what's the underlying and who's the counterparty, right? And how solvent are they? And, and why things all of a sudden blew up was because nobody knew what the value of the assets that they were holding was. Nobody knew. You didn't know. You, you, you had, you had no, there was no transparency. There was no opacity. There was no clear way. Now, on the commercial side, it's a little bit clearer. Uh, there's a service called TREP. T R E P P, and they they basically track all the. It's a very 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 expensive service, okay. Uh, but they track all, all these CMBS issuances, and they'll, you know, they they go all the way down to they know every loan on every securitization. You know, they know what's current. They they know the tenants. You know, they 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 know the leases. So it's it's like. If, if you're in this business, you need to pay for trap because then you, and there's a lot more sort of transparency and opacity in it, right? Um, in um, in the residential side, especially with all the ninja loans and uh, you know all days and you know whatever, plus all the fraud that there was. You know, people started saying, "Wait a minute! But there, this thing's not this says AAA, but there's no cash coming. What's wrong?" Wait a minute! I thought property values were going to continue to go up. People are defaulting on all these mortgages. What's going on? And if people couldn't say, "Well, where does it stop?" If it's AAA, how come there's default? There can't be defaults on AAA rated debt. I mean, that's counterintuitive. <coughs> so, anyway, I'll give you a bunch of notes on. Pros and cons, and this is from a, a grab bag of different sources. Okay, um, you saw who some of the major players were. Uh, like I said, you could do all kinds of you know different debt instruments in that. And we talked about enhancement. And then I'll I'll leave you with I'll leave you what a more detailed summary of what I just drew. Okay? So and you'll you'll get a couple of different views. You'll look at a Ginny May, you'll look at a Fannie Mae, and you'll look at a, just a typical sort of you know commercial uh, uh, process. So you'll see three different ones, okay, and you'll get a sense. Um, the, the purpose is not so much knowing. Um, so look, this is one, so a traditional one here, 8%, securities are all going out at 6%. The bank's taking a point <coughs> fee for enhancing it, and a fee's going to AIG for insurance. Okay, so just everybody makes money on all these. Okay, that's why they were being done, because everybody made money. So, and, um, but, but, you know, again, um, Um, somewhere between what the theory was and the practice, there was a lot of um, um, there were a lot of issues. Okay, so, okay let, me, let me read some of these things to you.
there's a slide, I can't find it now, but it talks, basically we talk about the, the lack of transparency, um, the over-exuberance on the ratings, okay, uh, basically the greed at the end of the day. So it all sort of, you know, fell apart. It's kind of coming back, so um, we're starting to see more securitizations. Um, Dodd-Frank's tried to address this uh, um, on the residential side, Dodd-Frank requires that mortgage originators who securitize or sell loans hold 5%. So it's something. So, you know, it used to be that people were originating, they didn't care about the credit quality because they were selling the mortgages to somebody else. It became somebody else's problem. Now at least originators need to retain some skin in the game. Is it foolproof? No. Is 5% a huge number? No. But it's at least a step in the right direction. Okay, and so I think you're going to continue to see, you know, oversight in this area, and I think people were so burnt that they have hesitated from demanding these type of <coughs> uh, instruments, and so they're, I, I forget the number, I, I, I think there were 50, 60 million, I'm sorry, billion dollars worth of um, securitized loans last year in the commercial space, but that's way off of the close to 200 million dollar, billion dollars we've done in the Years of 2006-2007. Okay. So with that, with that, um, we've gone through. We have now gone through all the textbook material, and we have now gone through all the presentations that I had. With that, I've also spoken with with Dr. Forgy, and I know that you guys have some of you guys. You guys have day off next week? Any of you guys doing the day off challenge? None of you are doing the day off challenge next month. If you don't know about it, you're not doing it. Okay, well, good, you're not doing that. That's one last thing you have to worry about. But, but um, with that said, we're going to do the final in class next week. Okay, just get it out of the way. Just get it done. Get it done. Just, well, here's how we're going to do it. You were asking some questions. Here we're going to do it. I'm, I'm going to send you some sample questions similar to what I did the last time. These will not be the same exact questions. They will be similar, very similar. They will not be the same exact questions. So, but at least you'll be able to prepare. I'm going to send you 20. We have not covered, so what are the 20? The 20 are on the last eight chapters that we've gone over and on presentations that we've heard in class. Now, the questions I sort of have like as a generic question set for this class, we have not gone through all of the articles that we had. So you're not going to be responsible. So for instance, there's a, a question on um, agricultural and timber investments. We didn't have a presentation on that, so that's not a question that will be asked. But what we'll do is, is we'll, uh, I'll give it to you, I'll have a week to go through it. Come, you know, come next Tuesday, um, bring a cup of coffee, bring your computer, whichever computer makes you happy, whatever keyboard you work with. Um, all your notes, your textbooks, spread out so that you've got plenty of room, and you have four hours to answer, you know, five questions. And, and um, so that at the end you can send me your Word document when you're done. <coughs> yeah, you think I'm going to read your handwriting for four hours? <laughs> no, so you're going to type, but. But 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 the hope is that you you know you you've already come with with the background. Now, what are the questions? I'll give you the questions. <clears throat> Let me give you the questions so that you can see. I mean, we've gone over all this stuff, and and you should have. I'll send you the notes from this class now. You know, tomorrow.
guys don't sound excited. Okay, so um, questions, for example, for example, a little bit more, um, you know, focused. What's an appraiser? Who's an appraiser? How's he regulated? How's the process work? Talk about ethical breaches in the process. Address banking regulations. What the, what bank? What steps do banks take in order to ensure the accuracy or fairness of appraisals? We had a presentation the other day that mentioned all of these. Things. Okay. Um, what are some of the major reasons to sell an asset? Should assets be viewed standalone or on a portfolio basis? Oh, on a portfolio basis. But why? We know the answer to that. Uh, um, should sell the decisions be micro or you know asset focused, or they should be macro focused, right? Talk about how holding period returns impact or holding period impacts returns. Um, talk about modern concepts of psychology of investing or behavioral economics. We've talked about risk aversion versus loss aversion, okay, uh, um, for example. Explain the four quadrants of real estate capital as we've defined them in this class. What's the relative scope or size of each one of those quadrants? Who are the major players in each one? What are the return, risk return expectations or profiles in all of them, okay? Um, what are the Six principal reasons for using leverage in real estate. We use that one today, so uh, I won't go through that. Um, what are the underpinnings of modern portfolio theory? Uh, what are historical uh, return and volatility expectations for retail? Okay. Um, what are the different subclasses? Uh, what are the historical return um, and volatility expectations for multifamily? Um, what are the main drivers behind the process known as securitization? So we just talked about that, right? Liquidity, right? Mm -hmm. Lowering costs, right? What are the macroeconomic benefits to buyers and sellers? Uh, what are the implications of originating to hold versus originating to sell? Okay. Um, uh, and the concept of dealing with fixed income securities address the concept of refinancing risk and explain how call protection works. We just went through it today. How does a lender pr protect himself against refinancing risk, right? Lockout period, yield maintenance, defeasance. I'm talking about rating agencies. What do rating agencies do? Why do investors want or need ratings? How about the office asset class? Um, cyclical patterns. Um, what are mortgage bankers? What do they do? Okay. Um, um, why real estate? What are the primary reasons for considering real estate in a portfolio? You know, well, what are the historical risk return profiles of real estate compared to other investment alternatives? Is real estate a hedge against inflation? If so, why? Discuss, discuss the different roles of investment banking firms. <coughs> and how they play in the financial markets. And what are their functions? We talked about, you know, asset management and underwriting and, and financial engineering and all the other things that they do. Um, what does an efficient capital market mean? And we talked about a weak form, semi-strong, and a strong form of efficient capital markets and what the implications of those were on investors and on arbitrage opportunities. Um, distinguish between primary and secondary markets and explain what are the first, second, third, and fourth markets. Um, contrast between fixed rate mortgages and, and adjustable rate mortgages. Compare and contrast between residential and commercial mortgages. So those are the questions. Those, that's, those are the pool of the questions. Um, I, I think we've, we've covered that. And I think you'll have notes from the textbook You'll have the textbook, but you'll have my lecture notes, okay? And hopefully the notes you've taken, which will give you enough of a basic. So here's the thing is, if you come here unprepared, you're not going to be able to answer the questions efficiently in four hours, right? So the disadvantage of, 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 of doing it in class is you can't just work on it two hours, leave it, go away, but you get it out of the way. And I can tell you, if you come prepared, you can answer, right? So... I don't, I don't suggest or recommend that you try to 
answer 20 questions in advance because that's not, and then just sort of like cut and paste. I don't think you need to do that, but I do think that you need to look at them. You probably need to spend a couple of hours looking at them and looking at your notes and organizing your notes and the files that I send so that you know where to find things. So when you get questions 3, 7, 8, and 12, you go, okay, okay, the section on um, call protection and refinancing risk, okay. Now I know how I can answer that. Let me go there. Okay, so, uh, but I think if you if you come cold, you're not going to finish. <coughs> but if you come, so I don't think you need to memorize anything. I don't think you need to write anything. But I think you do need to look at the questions, understand what's being asked. Okay, understand what's being asked, and organize your notes in such a fashion that you can get to that in order to answer the questions. Does that answer your questions? Do we have any other questions? I'll send those tomorrow. Uh, probably after 10 o'clock. And you're in the presentations? You're going to send them? The student presentations? Yes. Right, me too. I, 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 I'm candidly, and I've, 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 had, I've been asked that before, and I've never sent them out, and I'll tell you why. So I'm not comfortable that um, all the presentations have all the answers that you're looking for. You're going to have to rely on your notes for that. And I would hope that you've taken notes on the add-ons that I've had to the, where I've filled in gaps. Um, I, I'm pretty comfortable that we've talked between what the students have put together and what I've added on, that we've got answers to all of them. And if you've got doubts, you can send me questions. Don't ask me to answer the question. Don't say, hey, I don't have any notes on office. Can you tell me what's important? Okay? Um, I, you're welcome to study together, but don't share your work. Okay, don't. And, I'll, and here's the other problem. Um, I, I, I took a class once where something similar was done, but it was done as a take home thing. And a group of students got together and they just divided all the questions and said, okay, you do these three, you do these four, you do these five. And then they all shared it. But then the questions aren't the same. So you're answering things that aren't necessarily the questions. But, but I. The material is close enough that if you have gaps, um, you know, so I'll give you an example. Uh, you want to ask Chelsea about office, you know, ask her to send you the presentation. But, but that may not all be enough or all inclusive, right? You want appraisals, reach out to Bridget. You know, if she wants to share it with you, that's fine. But there may be other things over and above what are in her paper that we discussed in class.
was your COO, Matt. Uh, I'm going to take that. That's just who the guys, who my managing director, that's who he had talked to at some point. Also, the property So they said, do you have someone? No, I don't know. Nobody okay. knows. Yeah. Okay. Um, Chris Rotolo is the name of the person who styles to talk to her. Chris Rotolo. It's a, a sheet. Okay. Yeah. I'll send you, I'll just send you your name. Okay. But the problem is, I've never found, this is my personal problem, I have never found residential that pencils out when you do that. Now, do you know why people, but you know why people keep buying it? Why? Because people go, oh yeah, but then the appreciation, right? But because I don't appreciate money more. That's the problem. Right now. That's, that's the problem. That's expensive. The problem is, is you're saying, okay, coño, is that a good enough food? Now, the other, the other thing is people saying, yeah, and I can lever the hell out of this thing. Oh, I see. And I'm borrowing at 
And so my, my true, so then people look at their cash on cash return. So you're looking at return on equity, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. But you can say, okay, well, no. But if my equity all of a sudden is not 145, it's 10. What's my return? 10. Um, yeah, because I borrowed 135,000 bucks or whatever. I mean, that's how people make it work. I'm not telling you. That. Listen, I would never go into this business. No. In Hialeah, fucking man. Do the people be calling me to like the fucking fix your toilet and shit? No. no Turn that off, please. Two in the morning, yeah. Two in how do you turn this off? You're gonna get this zero six percent.